let's get started today. Uh, so I know we got folks out in the lobby. Everybody's kind of slowly making their way inside, and that's that's fine. We're gonna we're gonna go ahead and get started. But uh, we're so glad that you're here today at Calvary with us. Uh, if you're watching us online, uh, with our, our I want to say thank you for joining us. I want to uh, shout out to my wife, who I'm hoping is awake and watching this morning. So uh, she's down in Texas with our, our daughter. Actually, she's probably in church right now with our daughter and uh, her husband and their, their uh, uh, children's pastors in Seguin, Texas. So, so she's probably not watching right now. She might have it on. I don't know. So uh, love you, Gina. Miss you. And I'm so glad, though, that you chose to be here today, to chose to join us. So we're going we're gonna to step into worship here in just a moment. But I, I want to share just a couple of thoughts that are going to kind of set us up for where we're going. Uh, in our in the message today. So, what what if we were all in an orchestra together? Think about it. Think about it. A large ensemble of musicians gathered in string, woodwind, brass, and percussion sections. Each of us would have an instrument, and and some would play violin, some would play the cello, some would play the double bass. I mean, there, there's brass. There's brass instruments like the flugelhorn, the trumpet, the tuba, the, and then woodwinds like the flute, the oboe, the clarinet, and the, the bassoon. So, oh, oh we, we really can't forget the per- percussion session and the percussion section, okay? The timpani, the bass drum, the snare drum, the cymbals, uh, and, and all the other percussion instruments. And they're... There might be other instruments also in, in play in the orchestra, like, uh, like, like a concert grand piano or a concert harp. But let me just tell you, there's no banjos or kazoos. That's, 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 that, those are the only two that are excluded, I think. Okay? There's a, I know, I know it. There's a conductor. There's a conductor who's leading. There's, there's, uh, there's sheet music in front of all of us, and, and we're arranged on the, on the platform. We're arranged in our places according to the instrumental sections. But there's dissension in the ranks. A small group of people, a small group of people want to play their own compositions in their own different musical keys. A large group wants to, wants to play the tuba. They want to abandon their instruments to play the tuba because we all know Tuba players always get the girls. So I, that's just what I've heard, okay? All the third chair musicians, all the third chair musicians stage a revolt, and they attempt to move from the third chair, and they physically move their chairs up to the first or second chair. The percussion section, they, they are unhappy because they're in the back. They don't like being in the back, so they launch a preemptive strike. They move the, they, they move the bass drum and the timpani up front. The, and, and the guys playing the cymbals are just marching around just wherever they want to be, wherever they feel like being. There are several people who refuse to play at all. See, because they, they, they're first chair talent first chair talent. And if they can't stand out with solo parts, then they're, not, they're, they're unwilling to participate. So what's the result? Disorder. Chaos, right? Instead of every instrument complementary to the others, we have a riot, a cacophony of sound punctuated by arguing and bickering. Okay, all the while, all the while, the director is wrapping his baton, okay, that little stick that he uses to keep time, he's wrapping his baton uh, on the stand in front of him, attempting to gain a measure of control in all the confusion. And the whole event is undermined by disunity. And the audience, the audience, at first they're amused by all the musical mayhem, but eventually... They leave. They leave the auditorium disgusted because because of the behavior of the musicians. The evening evening leaves such a bad taste in their mouth that it's unlikely that they'll ever return. I mean, why? what should have been a beautiful evening of wonderful music devolved into a musical mess. And in turn... These witnesses to the musical madness warn everyone to not waste their time going to the orchestra. I've just described some Christians and some churches. 
They don't represent Christ. They don't represent the church well. They're not healthy. They, they can't help others heal. Their message is lost in the midst of the chaos. But here's what, here's what I want you to know. This is not who we are. Calvary is not a perfect place. We don't always get it right. We don't hit every note uh, right. We don't always get it right. We miss some notes. We're not always playing in, uh, on the same page or, or playing in the same time signature. But we are better together, always better together, especially, especially as we work toward this goal of everyone playing their instrument in beautiful harmony. See, when everyone works together, we become a place where beautiful music can happen, where people can identify, develop, and use their gifts and talents. We want to be that place. Calvary, I, we want Calvary to be that kind of place. We, a place where hearts are encouraged, where spirits are lifted, where, where sins are forgiven, and where lives are transformed. And, and I hope that's what you've experienced here at Calvary. Not perfection, but I hope you've experienced some of those things, some of that music. I hope, and I hope that's why you're here today. Sometimes the reason we end up in a church is because we left a church that was chaos, where there was only musical madness or mayhem, you know, I mean, but, but we're here together, and if it's true, okay, then we've come today to celebrate God's goodness and grace. We want to do that together, and we want to do it today, amen? amen. So every person has a role to fill. Every person has a role to fill. We don't come into God's church as consumers or as prima donnas. Don't look around, okay? We, we, come, we come as, as uh, well, let's put it this way. We don't come with the attitude of what can I get out of this? What's in it for me? That's not the goal. God's plan is for each one of us to contribute. Talking about the, uh, I'm not talking about just the offering, okay? Each one of us having a function, each one of us playing an instrument, each one of us having a gift or talent to be used. I like the way Paul puts it when he talks to the Ephesians in, in his letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. Listen, listen to this. Ephesians 4, 16. Paul says, God makes the whole body fit together perfectly. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts to grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. But pastor, I, what, do, what do I have to offer? What do I have to give? We said this two weeks ago. You only have to give what God has already placed in your hands. So we talked about this idea of re-gifting, and we asked a couple weeks ago, how many of you actually have ever re-gifted something, okay? You got a gift, you were like, eh, I'm going to bless somebody else with this gift, okay? So, so, so God has given you a gift, and he wants you to re-gift that to others. That's what we're reading about as we walk our way through Romans chapter 12 together. So turn there, Romans chapter 12. If, you're, uh, if you've got the version app, you can bring up uh, Romans chapter 12. And the other cool thing that you can do if you have that app is you can follow along in my notes uh, and my outline this morning and the scriptures that I'm using. And you can take notes in the version app. So I encourage you to do that. Okay, so this is why the Holy Spirit... It's this reason, that God wants us to give what he's already placed in our hands. All right? This is why the Holy Spirit moves Paul to give us a list of grace gifts here in, in, in Romans chapter 12. Somebody asked me last week, why, why do you use the term grace gifts? And Because that's what it says. That's what the, it says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts. So wouldn't you call that a grace gift? In his grace, he's given us different gifts. So, so we're picking it up at verse 6 here, Romans 12. It says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your, faith, if your gift is serving others, serve them well. If, you, if you're a teacher, teach well. <coughs> Those are the three gifts that we, that we covered uh, two weeks ago. 
All right, here's the next four. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If your, uh, I'm sorry, if your gift is to encourage others, verse 8, be encouraging. If it's giving, give joy. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if, you, and if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. So we've been talking about grace gifts. We're talking about re-gifting the blessing. So God blesses us with a gift. We re-gift it and minister to others. So again, this is not an exhaustive list of God's gifts. Some of you are going, wait, wait, he only mentions prophecy. Why doesn't he mention tongues or interpretation of tongues or healing? Or, because those are in Ephesians, or in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And then he talks about other gifts that God has given to the church in Ephesians 4. So in three places in the New Testament, we have gifts listed out. There's some overlap, but, but there is different, distinct differences in each, each of those listings of gifts. Okay, so this Romans 12 is just a good starting place for discussing the grace gifts. So uh, just real quick, let me remind you of the first three, all right? And then we'll spend the, the rest of our time uh, unpacking the, the last four gifts here, okay? So the first gift we said was sharing the gift of prophecy. Now we said that this was, prophecy is very broad. It's not just speaking about the future or what's to come. It's also giving insight or revelation about what's happening right now. Okay, so it's not, it's not just in the strict Old Testament sense of a prophet standing up and saying, this is what is going to happen, Israel. This is what's coming, people. It, it, it is, it's also insight, okay, and revelation into what's going on right now, what's happening. But, but what we said is the qualifier for this gift, this gift is easy to abuse, okay, because it's hard to know when it's legitimate, but the, the, the best test of this, friends, is there's two tests. Number one, does it correlate with God's word? Okay? In other words, if you hear a word of prophecy that contradicts what God says, guess what? It is a, it's false. It's not true. Okay? The other test of, of, of prophecy is whether or not it actually comes true. And this is the Old Testament uh, Test. If it didn't come true, now here's the thing, if it did come true, and you gave a word of prophecy and it didn't come true, you'd get stoned. They'd take you outside the camp, they'd pick up stones, and they would kill you. Because they didn't tolerate false prophets in the camp. So, so does that give you some, some idea of the gravitas, okay, the gravity of using, being used in this gift? It's not to be done lightly. And it's why we gave, two weeks ago, we gave some very specific instruction regarding the use of the gifts. Somebody asked me, what if I, I I'm not, I, I, I'm, sometimes I feel like the Lord wants me to say something or God has something for me to say. Here's what you can do. And, and you've never been using the gift or you don't know how to. So come to me. Bring it to me. I'm not the be all end all. Don't worry. Okay. You could go to somebody that's spirit, but you need to go to someone spiritually mature. Okay, somebody that has some mileage spiritually, and you talk to them about it. But if you're going to share the gift, okay, and you're not sure about it, you need to talk to me. Because if you're going to do it here, I want to know. Before, doesn't that just make sense? That way you don't make a mistake. That way it's not the, the, the pepperoni pizza you had last night just messing with you. You know? Come on, that happens. And sometimes the word that's shared is not for the body, it's for you. God is speaking to you. This happens a lot in Pentecostal churches where the gifts are encouraged. People have a word and they think it's for everybody, but the truth, the truth of it is it's not for everybody, it was for you. You just threw it up all over everybody. Thank you for sharing <laughs> I, I, that probably wasn't, well, that was true. Okay, so, okay. but listen, there's, there's some gravity to this. And, and that's why we can't, you know, we can't be like um, gunslingers in the Wild West, you know, just, you know, just, just shooting off, you know, wherever. I mean, that's crazy. People get hurt when people are reckless with this gift. Because it's too easy to weaponize this gift with your own agenda. And that's why... When we look at all seven gifts, but starting with this gift of prophecy, it's not about you. Okay? All right. So you don't want me to go any further on that, I'm sure. Because now nobody, I'm never doing that. I will never do that. 
Now, it's crazy because Paul says to eagerly desire the gifts. Okay? Pray. Ask God to be using the gifts. So if you feel like God's given you a word for the body, okay, and you're not sure, come, let's sit down, let's talk about it. Okay? I can't tell you, I respect the people that do that way more than, than, than people that just, you know, have a wild hair, if you know what I mean, and just kind of jump up and spout off. Okay? I, I won't let you make a mistake. I promise. I will not let you make a mistake. I want you to develop that gift. And by that way, that's part of my calling. Go to Ephesians 4 on this one. That's part of my calling as a pastor is to help you to develop, to equip you to develop the gifts that God has given you. It's part of my responsibility. So, so I don't mind helping in that, in that regard, okay? So, all right, let's, let's move to the second gift, and that's the gift of serving. All right, the, this one's kind of a no-brainer, but this is not just doing something nice for somebody every once in a while. This is someone who has a, who has a, a heart to serve. And, and, and the qualifier that we read two weeks ago was that if you have the gift of serving, serve how? Well. Serve well. Then the third gift was teaching. And that, again, this is not for everybody. Not everybody can be a teacher. Not everybody's qualified to be a teacher. Not, and, and believe me, there are some people that feel like they should be teachers that, have, that should not be teachers, okay, uh, that won't be teachers, okay, because there are qualifications for teachers. It's a leadership. There's a high responsibility. In fact, Paul says this to Timothy. He says, teachers, not everybody should want to be teachers because teachers will be judged at a higher, a higher standard than everyone else. All right, so teachers need to be good students. That means they need to be teachable, all right, but they need to be good students. And, and the communication aspect of this, this is where people kind of get hung up, okay? There are some people that feel that they want to do this, but they've never done it before. They want to teach. They want to be a part of this. So listen, what, what we do here at Calvary is we'll pair you up with someone that has the gift of teaching, and you can learn from them. Doesn't that just make sense? And develop your gift in a, in a safe setting with someone, with some oversight and someone helping you. That just makes sense to me. I don't know if it makes sense to you, okay? All right, so let's get the rest of the gifts here. Let's get it. The fourth gift is sharing the gift of encouragement. And I know it says in verse 8, it says, if, you're, if your gift is, is to encourage others, be encouraging. So shouldn't everyone at Calvary be encouraging? Have you found everybody at Calvary encouraging? <laughs> I didn't know. Okay? Not everybody has the gift, I promise you. Not everybody. And I, I mean, you want, yeah, sure, we want everybody to be encouraged. We want everybody to be encouraging and to be encouraged at Calvary. But the truth is, this is not, this is exceptional. Okay? Uh, there are some people who, who are so exceptionally gifted with encouragement, they're looking for opportunities. And by the way, this is not, this is not pie in the sky, um, every cloud has a silver lining kind of optimism. That's not the kind of encouragement we're talking about. We're talking about to encourage means to pour in courage. To in, I in, to encourage, to pour in courage fresh courage into people that are faltering. People that are stumbling, people that are hurting, people that need a word so that they can keep on going. See, that requires, this gift requires that we be aware of the people around us. I believe this, this gift of encouragement requires a Holy Spirit sensitivity to the needs around us. So that, so that, um, so that if the Holy Spirit says, hey, um, I want you to say something to that person. I want you to, I, I want you to send them a text. Or so God put somebody on your heart and you, you, you shoot them a text and just say, hey, I'm thinking about you. I'm praying for you today. Or, hey, you know, the Lord put you on my heart today. How many of you ever received something like that from somebody? Okay. Raise your hands if you did. Okay. Were you encouraged by that when you found out that God had put you on someone else's heart? Kind of out of the blue. See, that's someone being used in the gift of encouragement. Life's hard. Life is hard. And living for Jesus has its own challenges. Let's be honest. So we grow weary. We grow weary. And the enemy of our soul loves to... And there is an enemy. Okay? The enemy of your soul loves... He takes note of that weariness. And so he, he, he comes to your door trying to sell you discouragement. It's one of his favorite weapons. 
discouragement. And in, and in, and in these, in the current days that we live in, <laughs> in the current days with pandemic uncertainty, not pandemic COVID, pandemic uncertainty, with pandemic fear. Am I, am I saying right? It's not just a virus, friends. The, the virus is, is, it's a virus of fear. It's a virus of uncertainty. And there are Christians that, that are afraid right now and that are uncertain right now. We talked a lot about this as we talked about the journey this past summer. But listen, the church desperately needs those with the gift of encouragement. Okay? We need someone to lift us up, to strengthen us. We need someone to instill, to pour fresh courage for the battle into our hearts and into our lives. Max Lucado, Max Lucado has the gift of encouragement. I know people knock his teaching and his writing for being, you know, kind of shallow. It's not deep enough. But that's not really what beat up and discouraged people need. Are you listening? Beat up and discouraged people don't need deep teaching. Brother, I'm going to unpack God's word for you and show you the Greek and the Hebrew meaning of all this. That's not what beat up and discouraged people need. Beat up and discouraged people, you know, they don't even need a prescription. Listen, you just need to take two of these and don't call me in the morning. Seriously. And, and I know, I, and I can be, ju- I, I can be, th- this is, I, I'm a guy, so I, t- I tend to think in terms of solutions. So you bring a problem to me, Tina, you bring a problem to me, and I'm like, okay, Tina, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do one, two, three, boom, hey, nice seeing you, have a, have a good week, we'll see you on Sunday. And that's, that's, I mean, but that may not be what she needs in this moment. That's not the encourage. she doesn't need an outline, Right? She doesn't need a prescription. She needs encouragement. So this gift in this day is really important. So Max Lucado, he, he, he's so good at this. I want you to hear an excerpt from a little booklet that he wrote called Let the Journey Begin. Just, just listen to this. I'm, and I, I, I'm just going to read it straight, straight to you, okay? If God, if God is mighty enough to ignite the sun... I I just got to repeat that phrase. If God is mighty enough to ignite the sun with a word, could it be that he's mighty enough to light your path? God is for you, he writes. Not maybe, not has been, not was, not would be, but God is. He is for you. He says, today, at this hour, in this minute, as you read this or as you hear this, he says, no need to wait in line, no need to come back tomorrow. He is with you. He could not be closer than he is at this second. His loyalty won't increase if you're better, and it won't lessen if you're worse. He is for you. God is for you. Turn to the sidelines, and it's God that's cheering you as you run. Look past the finish line. It's God that's applauding your every step. Encouraging you to come on and finish the race. Listen for him in the bleachers. And he's shouting your name. Are you too tired to continue? Max Lucado writes, uh, he asks us that question. Are you too tired to continue? He'll carry you. Are you too discouraged to fight? He's picking you up. God is for you. God is for you. If he had a calendar, your birthday would be on it. Your birthday would be circled on it. If he drove a car, your name would be on his bumper. If there's a tree in heaven, he's carved your name in the bark. We know that he has a tattoo. And we know what's written on that tattoo. Because in Isaiah 49 verse 16, it says, I have written your name on my hand. Come on. God is for you. Isn't that encouraging? We need to know that. In pandemic uncertainty, we need that. Look, and the qualifier for this is be encouraging. 
Not do encouragement. See, I can do that. I can do encouragement, but there are some people that exude. That means it comes out of their pores, you know? It's such a part of the, part of the fabric of who they are. It, they exude encouragement. That's their gift. They don't even have to say anything. When you hang out with them, when you hang around them, you are encouraged. And if you have this gift at Calvary, we need you. Stat. Right? Stat. Right now, encourage, refresh, strengthen those that are around you. That's the gift of encouragement. How about the next gift? The gift of, of giving. We need to share the gift of giving. So, it, Paul says in verse 8 again, if, if, if it's giving, if your gift is giving, give how? Generously, okay? Some Bible versions will say with sincerity, and we'll explain that in a minute. Over the years, I've given a, a bunch, I, I want to say hundreds, of spiritual gifts inventories to people here at Calvary. That's a, we usually do it in, in our, uh, our membership, our Discover uh, Connections membership class, where we give, at the end of the class, I, I send it home with them, kind of like a homework, and it's like, hey, let's, let's talk about your spiritual gifts. Let's, uh, we're going to use a diagnostic tool to kind of, to kind of reveal that, what the spiritual gifts might, what gift or gifts you might have, where you're strong, maybe where you're weak. This is one area, the area of gifting is one area that's truly rare. Most people do not score high or even average, but typically are below average in giving when they score. I'm telling you the truth. I've done a bunch of these. They score really low in giving. I've wondered about that. Why in a test that has 110 questions that are meant to be answered just quickly, without overthinking, without, you know, you know, just from your gut, you just answer the questions. You know, just from your heart, you just answer it. You don't overanalyze it and why do people not score better at giving? And I think I've, I've come up with two reasons. Number one, it's self-perception. Self-perception. See, people that operate in the gift of giving, they don't recognize that gift. It's such a part of them, they don't see it that way. It's just who they are. They're, I, I mean, they're, they're, they, their first reflex is, if they see a need, they want to meet the need. If they hear about something, they're, they're going to the store to, to, to help meet the need. It's just such a part of them. They just don't think of that. So it's, it's self-perception. They don't see themselves as being particularly gifted in giving. And, and the other part is they don't want to be recognized and they don't want to be honored. Typically, people that operate in this gift have no desire to be recognized or honored. They don't want their name on, the, on a, you know, I bought the pew at Calvary Assembly of God, so, you know, your family name's on the pew, or I bought the toilet at, at Calvary Assembly of God, so my name's on the toilet every time you go. Have you ever been in one of those churches where everything, you know, all the, all the glass windows and all the, all the, you know, has a name attached to it? I would, guarantee, I would almost guarantee that most of those people are not givers. They gave, but that's not their gift. Because, because givers don't, don't want that. They don't need it. Okay? So it's self-perception. The other reason I think people don't like, don't, don't want to really acknowledge this gift is because of self-preservation. Okay? Because if I score high in giving, then pastor is going to expect me to fund the next building program. Actually, this gift is very easily abused. Okay? We talk, uh, I, I introduced a phrase uh, to Miss Debbie's counseling, uh, and some of you have heard this uh, repeatedly because you struggle with this because you're giving people, you're compassionate people. There, there is such a thing as stewarding your compassion. And if you're a giver, if you're a giver, you just always want to give. You just always want to be giving. You always want to be doing. And it's too easy, friends, to exhaust that and then resent it. Does that make sense? So, so that's why you've got to steward. You've got to be a good steward. If, you, if this is your gift, you've got to be a good steward of, of that gift. Okay? And you don't give just to everybody or anything. But you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Just as the person who prophesies has to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, or the person who teaches or serves or, okay, or encourages, you as a giver, with the gift of giving, needs to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit just as much as anybody else. Doesn't that just make sense? 
And that way the gift is not abused. That way you don't exhaust yourself. Okay? That way you don't have to, you know, you don't, you don't have to worry about self-preservation. This gift of giving means contributing to help the needs of others around you. What would a church full of generous people look like? What would a, what would a church full of people, giving generous people look like? Wait, you know what? We have an example in Scripture. Acts chapter 2. All we have to do is read the, uh, about the dynamic church in Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 44, and this is what it says. This is the description. Listen. It says, And all the believers met in one place, and they shared everything they had. They sold property and possessions, and they shared with those in need. They worshiped together in the temple every day. They met in homes uh, at, for the Lord's Supper. They shared meals they, with great joy and generosity. Verse 47 says, And all were praising God. All the people praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. How's that for a description of a generous church? But let's be honest. Have you ever given something expecting something in return? Don't raise your hands and don't look at somebody near you, okay? Probably every one of us, uh, to some degree, has given kind of expecting something back. See, the qualifier for this gift is to give generously. If you go back to the original Greek word, it, it's with sincerity. The Greek word is act, actually uh, ha, hapalotis. Hapalotis. And it means a single focused attitude, a consistency of intent and, and an absence of ulterior motive. Giving with caring generosity and not expecting anything in return. That's the gift of giving. Here, how about the next gift? Sharing the gift of leadership. Okay. This one's going to be fun. If, <laughs> if God has given you leadership ability, Paul writes, take the, re the responsibility. Take the responsibility seriously. That's really interesting. <clears throat> he doesn't use this phrase at all. He doesn't use the phrase lead, lead well. That's not the qual qualifier. The qualifier is to take it seriously. So in all likelihood, the original meaning of this word referred to leaders of the church. In fact, Paul uses the same word, the same Greek word, in two other places. In 1 Thessalonians 5.12, let me read it for you. 1 Thessalonians 5.12, this is what he says. Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are leaders among you. They work hard among you, and they give you spiritual guidance. That's 1 Thessalonians 5.12. Then to Timothy, he, he says this, 1 Timothy 5.17. Elders who do their work well should be respected and paid well. I'm going to just repeat that last phrase because you probably didn't hear it. Elders who, right, let's, let's read it from the top, okay, because I might have stumbled. Let me see, I'm, I'm looking at the screen there. Elders who do their work well should be respected and paid well. <laughs> Especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. Let's be honest, a church with too many leaders and not enough followers is doomed to disunity. Not everybody can be first chair in the orchestra. Not everybody can be. Okay? I've been there. I've experienced that from out of control, unaccountable leaders to, to board members who felt like they were elected in order to, to uh, keep the management, that's the pastor, the management in check. I've seen that. I've been in those kind of places. And you talk about disunity. You talk about, about crazy disunity in those kind of dysfunctional places. Okay? 
That's not why people are elected to, to lead. It's not why people are appointed to lead. It's not just to create accountability. It's not just to create, uh, you know, checks and balances. I mean, those things are, are important. Don't get me wrong. Accountability is important with leadership. Uh, that, that, that's absolutely true. But the idea is not to keep the management in check. I pastored. I've pastored with people that had that mentality. And it's miserable. Because every initiative, every time you take a step forward, every time you feel like God is leading and directing, there's someone there going, up, oh, hold it, we need to take a vote. Oh, hold it, we're going to take a vote on this. Not here. Not at Calvary. Because you will slow us down, we will have no momentum. Because every time we get a little bit of spiritual momentum, every time we get up to speed, there'll be somebody going, wait, stop, stop, stop it. Everybody stop. We need to, we need to make sure that pastor isn't out of control and unchecked here. We need to slow this process down. Not here. Baby, if we got momentum, we're just going to roll right over you. I don't mean that in an arrogant way. It sounded arrogant. I'm sorry. I, I, but I, I don't mean that. I'm just telling you, I'm not going to let you slow us down. If God's given us direction, if God wants us to move forward, if God wants us to take a step of faith, we're going to take the step of faith. And if it, the step of faith is right over you, then that's what we're going to do. We're just, I, I mean, those days of checks and balances and those days of, all, now listen, if I was out of control, listen, I've got, I'm accountable to the board, the elected board of the church, I'm absolutely accountable to them. And they know that if, that if I make a decision, that, that or, or if I want to make a decision and that they don't agree with, listen, I won't do it. I won't move forward. Because I want us to be in unity. I want us to work together. I don't want us to be t playing the tug-of-rope game I described a few weeks ago. That's not going to happen. We don't play those kind of games here. That's, you can't... Listen, do you, I know I've mentioned this to you before, but um, I, there, there's, there's a children's book that describes a uh, Dr. Doolittle. You guys remember? That? I, I know there was a terrible movie recently uh, about that, but the original book describes. And I remember having the book as a as a child. And in that book, there's a horse that's called the Push Me Pull Me. Do you guys anybody know that? The Push Me Pull Me was a horse that had two heads. The horse could never go anywhere unless one head cooperated. With, I mean, that's just no way to live. Okay. So I, I, I take this, I do take this seriously. I take this responsibility seriously. I know that I'll be judged, absolutely judged at a higher standard as a pastor, as a leader. I understand that. I embrace it. I, I know that's just part and parcel of what it means to be a spiritual leader uh, of a church. I get it. I don't even need to be reminded of that. It scares me. It's, it, it, I don't... Um, my ego is not tied to things. That's, that's why I, I, uh, pastors, that, that, pastors that have their egos tied to numbers, for instance. What, what, if you tie your ego to numbers, what happens? Every time the numbers go up, what happens? Your ego goes up. She can't do it. That's why God's kept us small, okay? So, so my ego just stays small. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Look, I, we, we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful here, okay? We absolutely have to be careful here, and we've got to move. We, th this requires, uh, this is a responsibility that has to be taken seriously, and I get it. So, so listen, uh, let's keep that, keep that rolling, if you would, please. Um, because earlier in Paul's letter to Timothy, this is what he writes, okay? To, Timothy's a young leader in the church in Ephesus, and this is what Paul writes to him. He says, he says I'm going to give you some qualifications for leadership in the, in the local church. Listen to these qualifications. This starts in 1 Timothy chapter 3. We, we did a study on this a year or so ago. And this is what he said in verse 4. He says, he says, the leader, okay, this is the same word that Paul uses in Romans 12. He says, the leader must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? A church leader must not be a new believer because, because he might become proud and, and the devil would cause him to fall. 
Verse 7, also people outside the church must speak well of him so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. So look, this is not about position. It's not about power. I, I, I promise, I, I know I said these things and, uh, and, and it's always weird to talk about being a, a leader, to, you know, and you're a leader. Okay? It's, I'm just, how do, I, how do you do that and not sound arrogant? Thank you, Debbie. I was looking for a nicer word than that. <laughs> Something softer, more cuddly, just like me. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, you know better. Uh, Paul's describing here maturity and responsible leadership in the home and in the community. Maturity and responsible leadership at home and the community. Ultimately, there's only one kind. Listen, all that said, everything I just said, ultimately there's only one kind of leadership that's described in the New Testament. Only one kind. Servant leadership. Servant leadership. That's why the gift of leadership is a responsibility that should be taken seriously. All right, let's, do, let's look at the last gift, all right? Sharing the gift of kindness. Sharing the gift of kindness. If you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. This is interesting because uh, the gift of showing mercy, that's, that's another, uh, I think the New American Standard uses that. The gift of showing mercy means being sensitive to and responsive to the needs of those around you. This kindness, this gift of kindness means being sensitive to but also being responsive to. It's not just being able to identify that someone needs kindness, but actually taking that next step of showing them kindness. Does that make sense? Responsive. Not just aware, but responsive. Someone once said that mercy is the deepest gesture of kindness. Mercy is the deepest gesture of kindness. Which is why Jesus' best illustration of loving your neighbor is a story that goes by the title of what? The Good Samaritan. You can read it in Luke chapter 10. But just let me recap it real quick. See, think about it. It wasn't, it wasn't the religious leader and it wasn't the pious scribe who knew God's word that helped the wounded man on the side of the road. It was an outcast, a despised Samaritan who, stooped, who stopped and then who stooped down to help the man and then sacrificed in order to care for him. Jesus uses the, the Samaritan as an example, a, a group of people that, that, that were despised by righteous Jews. That kindness that the good Samaritan shows, friends, is the same kind of kindness that you and I need to show. That's why, that's why if we're going to go out and protest on the streets, if you can't do it with kindness, then you can't do it. That's why destroying other people's property... You don't have a right to do that. Nobody has a right to do that. Nobody. No matter how bad the grievance is. And the reason I know that, and I repeat this again, is because that's not what Jesus would do. You don't see him picking up torches and attacking the Roman garrison. Not only because that would be foolish, but because that's not who Jesus is. Are you listening? That's not who he is. I'm not saying that there's not a point to be made. I'm just telling you how you make your point is important. How you make the point. point. And I'm going to tell you some, a, little, a little nugget that my dad and my mom always taught me. And that is you can, you can attract more people with honey than you can with vinegar. How many of you heard that phrase? That, that, you, know, that little, you probably had it cross-stitched in your grandmother's wall, right? See, I'm not, listen, this is not about, you know, and I know, listen, if you're, if you're watching this or you're listening to me and you're saying, well, that's easy for you to say, you know, because whatever. I, I, look, okay, disregard the color of my skin and just read the red letters of your Bible. This is the, this is the standard. Not me. I'm not, remember, we talked about this. I'm not the standard. You don't measure your life up against me. You measure your life up against God. His word. So if we can't see Jesus doing it, why are we doing it?
I'm not trying to poke anybody. I'm not trying to be, I'm not, and I'm not angry. I'm just, just telling you what, what I know. Kindness works, friends. Kindness works. I know you've seen the signs all over, you know, maybe all over town, just be kind. And that's, that's a beautiful, that's, that's a wonderful uh, gesture. It is. But it's just a sign if you're not kind. Okay? That's like having the honk if you love Jesus bumper sticker in your car. And getting to a red light and somebody's in front of you and somebody, when the light turns green, they don't move fast enough. So you lay on the horn a little bit and, right? And then if they don't move fast enough, then you, you shout at them and you, you know, and you question their, you know, their uh, IQ and you uh, maybe even give them a finger or two. I mean, it, 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 you, we destroy our witness if we're not kind. But here's the cool thing. This, this is a gift of kindness. And people that have this gift, they've got to also steward the gift. Because disappointment and pain, feeling taken advantage of, can harden the heart and keep this gift from being used. That's why Paul tells the Galatians this. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, he says, look, let's not get tired of doing what's good. Do you hear that? Let's not get tired of doing what's good. He says, at just the right time, if you continue to do good, at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up, if we don't quit being good, if we don't quit being kind. Therefore, whenever we have an opportunity... Whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone. And then he he adds, especially to those in the family of faith. In other words, kindness starts right here. True kindness is demonstrative. It's not not a feeling, okay? True kindness is demonstrated. But it, it, again, has no expectation of recognition. Yo! I, I heard a guy at Kroger. Yo! He's in, he's in the aisle. Check it out! <laughs> I just helped this old lady get her cereal box from the top shelf. I was kind! <laughs> Check it out! I'm a really kind person. I helped park the cart. You know, I, I mean, kind people don't run around having to be recognized for it, right? Kindness is a gift that doesn't, again, it doesn't expect anything in return because it's not about you. You don't do it so you feel good. That's, and by the way, that's a pretty good indicator whether or not you have the gift or not. If you do it just because you, it makes you feel good, you probably don't have the gift of kindness. You just did kindness. Genuine kindness can't be done grudgingly. And that's why Paul says, share this gift gladly. That's the qualifier. Share the gift gladly gladly. So, so what would a church full of prophets, teachers, servants, encouragers, givers, leaders, and kind people look like? What would that kind of church look like? I have no idea. I've never been in it. I've never been in that kind of church, ever. But here's the good news. Listen, we don't need to have a church full of those people. We just need gifted people using their gifts. So if God is placed it in your hands, re-gift it, and bless other people with it. Use your gift. The crazy thing about that evening at the orchestra, the crazy thing is that the potential for a beautiful symphony was there the whole time. The potential for a beautiful symphony of sound was still there. In spite of the bickering, in spite of all the, all the jockeying for position, everyone just needed to work together, content with their place, following the lead of the conductor. Everybody on the same page of music, in the same measure, okay? And following the same beat. Beautiful symphony of sound can occur when people work together. See, there's going to be missed notes, okay? Don't... Let, let's be honest. There's going to be some notes that get missed. You might have, hopefully you didn't notice it, but you might have noticed today that 
I might have missed a note or a word. Okay? That's going to happen, not just when we lead worship, but it's going to happen sometimes among us. Some people are going to miss things. They're going to miss a note. Hopefully what you and I can do is have enough grace to look past the missed note. Every once in a while, every, every once in a while we'll, we'll start a song in the wrong key. Um, either uh, the singer will start or uh, <clears throat> some instrument. Won't mention any names, Debbie Green. Um, but uh, somebody will start in the wrong key and... and um, and it is totally embarrassing. I mean, it, it is, I, I'm just telling you, every one of us up here, it, it's lonely up here. And, and all of a sudden, you know, you're singing in the wrong key. And, and, you know, you just, I mean, you just want to just slowly crawl off the platform through that side door over there and out of here. I mean, it, it just, it, it is absolutely, it's crazy. But here's the thing. Here's the beautiful thing. We've never gotten booed here at Calvary. What? We've never gotten booed here. Never. Nobody's ever said, oh, get that trash off the platform. Get it. Get him off. Get the, you know, oh, his preaching is weak and anemic. Oh, get him off. You know, that's just never, ha- it's never happened here. I've been here 19 years. Nobody's ever booed the worship team. Ever. Do you know why? Even that's even when we, we miss notes or we, 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 we sing the wrong part of the song or, or, or somebody like the pianist just does something weird and, you know, um, or, or, you know, the drummer. Uh, let's not even talk about the drummer. Okay, so, I mean, you know, but somebody does something wrong, you know. Uh, a few weeks ago, the drummer ended the song early. And we all just, really? Uh, you know, okay, I guess we're done. Sly says we're done, we're done, Okay. <laughs> Nobody booed Sly. Nobody booed the worship team. No, it just didn't happen. You know why? Because you show grace when people miss the notes. When people mess up, you show this beautiful grace. And here's the application, friends. You need to do the same thing for one another. Some people are going to miss the notes. Sometimes somebody's going to get upset and leave. But we never celebrate that. Because we're always better together. We don't celebrate that. When we come together, when we love one another in spite of our differences, when everyone shares their grace gift, (laughs) you've got a gift. When everyone comes and shares their grace gift, we will be a healthier place we will be a vibrant place. We'll be a helping and a healing place. And our music together, our music together, our message, because that's what our music is, our message will be beautiful. It'll be refreshing. And it will be irresistible. If that's the kind of church that you want to be a part of, you've got a part to play. You've got a part to play. It all begins with getting your relationship right, though this is where it all starts, getting your relationship with the conductor right. The one that's in charge, not the pastor, okay? Your relationship with God, right. So if you've pursued your own musical agenda, if your life is musical mayhem, If there's any sinful selfishness in your life, this is the perfect time to pray this prayer with me. Would you guys bow your heads? Come on. I want you to pray. I I, I so wish that we could open our altars right now. I so wish that we could... uh, that, that we could spend a few minutes together here, but uh, with, with all the restrictions, we're not able to do that. So what I want to do is I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray a prayer, and um, it, you pray your prayer, okay? You pray your prayer, but if, you, if this is new to you, okay? If you're watching us on, online, and if this is new to you, then, I, then you can pray this prayer that I pray, but what I'm asking you to do is pray it from your heart. That's, that's the most important, that you mean it, Okay? Sometimes praying somebody else's words, just that it's some, some things are lost in translation. So that's why it's always better if you pray your words, your prayer. But I'm just going to give you a guide to pray, and, and then you can pray it your way. So let's do that, okay? Jesus, you're my standard. You're the standard. Your word exposes the truth of my life, the truth of my heart. 
And I, I, God, I've come here today because I know that I, I've sinned. So God, I'm, I'm, I confess my sin today. And God, I pursued my own music <laughs> in my own way, in my own, doing, trying to do life on my own terms. And I know that because of that, I've fallen far from, from your standard, from what you want from my life. So, so please forgive me, Jesus. Forgive my sin. Forgive my rebellion. And I believe, I, today, I believe that you died on the cross for me, that you rose again. I believe that, Jesus. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose again. I believe that you died for my sin, for my rebellion. I believe you rose again victorious over all of that, over sin, over death, and over hell. So I put my faith today in what you've done for me, Jesus. Father, thank you for sending Jesus for me. Thank you for making me a part of of your orchestra. Thank you, God, that I belong now. And God, I, I want to follow your music for my life. And by your grace, by your grace, God, I want to use the abilities and the talents and the gifts that you've given me, first to glorify you, and then secondly, to bless others. Not about me, God. Not about me. I want you to get the glory, and I want others to be blessed. I don't want my life to be about me. I want my life to be and to glorify you. So Holy Spirit, convict me. Convict me when I'm stingy or selfish with these gifts. Make me aware of the needs around me and move me, stir me to minister to those that are in need, those who need it the most. Holy Spirit, help me to bless others by re-gifting what the Father has given me and empower me. Help me, Holy Spirit, empower me to live more like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me talk, uh, if, you're, if you're new to Calvary today, I, I, let me share something. If you're watching us online, if you prayed that prayer, I want to share a resource that will help you in, your, in your new life with Jesus. The resource is journeyonline.org. If you go to journeyonline.org, you're going to see a ton of resources there to help you with tough life issues, to help you with, to, to get insights on, in, uh, on the Bible, to help you grow in your relationship with God, and also to help you connect with others who are part of this, this, this orchestra, this, this beautiful and symphony that God wants you to be a part of. It's our privilege, it's always our privilege to spend this time with you today. So we encourage you to find a church home. We are better together. Church was God's idea, and he wants you to connect and be a part of what he is orchestrating there. So I encourage you to do that. We'd love for you to join us right here at Calvary. So uh, if you'd like to know more about who we are, then you can go to our website, Calvary Connects. That's with an S, calvaryconnects.com. And I, I, I hope that you'll do that. There's a place uh, to, to message us. There's a place to let us know how to pray for you. So uh, we, we want you to do that. I'm going to be back in a few minutes with a few closing thoughts, but I... We need to take a few minutes right now. Take a few minutes right now, and we need to we need to give God thanks. So life is not meant to be a solo song. Isn't that good news? We aren't meant to sing the the, the song solo through life. God brought us together, messy and in desperate need of grace. And we This is what Paul says here in Romans 12. We belong to each other. Your gifts combined with others can create a wonderful symphony that celebrates and glorifies God right here at Calvary Assembly of God. So ask ask the Father to fill you with the Holy Spirit afresh, anew, to fill you with the Holy Spirit and to empower you to be more like Jesus. Ask the Father to fill you with the Spirit. And, and listen, and friends, share your song. Share your song. Share your story with someone this week. 
even if it's not a dramatic story, even if it's not a, uh, even if even if it's kind of well, I grew up in church all my life. That's my story, you know. I mean, I don't have a dramatic story. I didn't live on the streets. I wasn't part of a gang. I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't do drugs. I didn't, wasn't an alcoholic. I, you know, I, I was just a kid born in church who needed Jesus. <laughs> right? Okay. Tell people what God has done in your life. And invite them to experience the beautiful symphony of God's grace and love right here at Calvary. Take that next step. Invite them to come and be a part of what we have and what we celebrate here at Calvary. Amen? Amen. Amen.